Section thirty nine. Chapter eighteen. Future condition of three races. Part seven. The inhabitants of the United States talk a great deal of their attachment to their country. But I confess that I do not rely upon that calculating patriotism which is founded upon interests, and which a change in the interests at stake may obliterate. Nor do I attach much importance to the language of the Americans, when they manifest in their daily conversations the intention of maintaining the federal system adopted by their forefathers. A government retains its sway over a great number of its citizens, far less by the voluntary and rational consent of the multitude, than by that instinctive and to a certain extent involuntary agreement which results from similarity of feelings and resemblances of opinion. I will never admit that men constitute a social body simply because they obey the same head and the same laws. Society can only exist when a great number of men consider a great number of things in the same point of view, when they hold the same opinions upon many subjects, and when the same occurrences suggest the same thoughts and impressions to their minds. The observer who examines the present condition of the United States upon this principle will readily discover that although the citizens are divided into twenty-four distinct sovereignties, they nevertheless constitute a single people, and he may perhaps be led to think that the state of the Anglo-American Union is more truly a state of society than that of certain nations of Europe which live under the same legislation and the same prince. Although the Anglo-Americans have several religious sects, they all regard religion in the same manner. They are not always agreed upon the measures which are most conducive to good government, and they vary upon some forms of the government which it is expedient to adopt, but they are unanimous upon the general principles which ought to rule human society. From Maine to the Floridas, and from the Missouri to the Atlantic Ocean, the people is held to be the legitimate source of all power. The same notions are entertained respecting liberty and equality, the liberty of the press, the right of association, the jury, and the responsibility of the agents of government. If we turn from their political and religious opinions to the moral and philosophical principles which regulate the daily actions of life and govern their conduct, we shall still find the same uniformity. The Anglo-Americans acknowledge the absolute moral authority of the reason of the community, as they acknowledge the political authority of the mass of citizens and they hold that public opinion is the surest arbiter of what is lawful or forbidden, true or false. The majority of them believe that a man will be led to do what is just and good by following his own interest rightly understood. They hold that every man is born in possession of the right of self-government, and that no one has the right of constraining his fellow creatures to be happy. They all have a lively faith in the perfectibility of man, they are of opinion that the effects of the diffusion of knowledge must necessarily be advantageous, and the consequences of ignorance fatal. They all consider society as a body in a state of improvement, humanity as a changing scene, in which nothing is or ought to be permanent, and they admit that what appears to them to be good today may be superseded by something better tomorrow. I do not give all these opinions as true, but I quote them as characteristic of the Americans. The Anglo-Americans are not only united together by these common opinions, but they are separated from all other nations by a common feeling of pride. For the last fifty years no pains have been spared to convince the inhabitants of the United States that they constitute the only religious, enlightened, and free people. They perceive that for the present their own democratic institutions succeed, whilst those of other countries fail. Hence they conceive an overweening opinion of their superiority, and they are not very remote from believing themselves to belong to a distinct race of mankind. The dangers which threaten the American Union do not originate in the diversity of interests or of opinions, but in the various characters and passions of the Americans. The men who inhabit the vast territory of the United States are almost all the issue of a common stock, but the effects of the climate, and more especially of slavery, have gradually introduced very striking differences between the British settler of the southern states and the British settler of the north. In Europe it is generally believed that slavery has rendered the interests of one part of the Union contrary to those of another part, 
but I by no means remarked this to be the case. Slavery has not created interests in the South contrary to those of the North, but it has modified the character and changed the habits of the natives of the South. I have already explained the influence which slavery has exercised upon the commercial ability of the Americans in the South, and this same influence equally extends to their manners. The slave is a servant who never remonstrates, and who submits to everything without complaint. He may sometimes assassinate, but he never withstands his master. In the South there are no families so poor as not to have slaves. The citizen of the southern states of the Union is invested with a sort of domestic dictatorship from his earliest years. The first notion he acquires in life is that he is born to command, and the first habit which he contracts is that of being obeyed without resistance. His education tends, then, to give him the character of a supercilious and a hasty man, irascible, violent, and ardent in his desires, impatient of obstacles, but easily discouraged if he cannot succeed upon his first attempt. The American of the northern states is surrounded by no slaves in his childhood. He is even unattended by free servants, and is usually obliged to provide for his own wants. No sooner does he enter the world than the idea of necessity assails him on every side. He soon learns to know exactly the natural limit of his authority. He never expects to subdue those who withstand him by force. And he knows that the surest means of obtaining the support of his fellow creatures is to win their favor. He therefore becomes patient, reflecting, tolerant, slow to act, and persevering in his designs. In the southern states the more immediate wants of life are always supplied. The inhabitants of those parts are not busied in the material cares of life, which are always provided for by others, and their imagination is diverted to more captivating and less definite objects. The American of the South is fond of grandeur, luxury, and renown, of gaiety, of pleasure, and above all of idleness. Nothing obliges him to exert himself in order to subsist, and, as he has no necessary occupations, he gives way to indolence, and does not even attempt what would be useful. But the equality of fortunes, and the absence of slavery in the North, plunge the inhabitants in those same cares of daily life which are disdained by the white population of the South. They are taught from infancy to combat want, and to place comfort above all the pleasures of the intellect or the heart. The imagination is extinguished by the trivial details of life, and the ideas become less numerous and less general, but far more practical and more precise. As prosperity is the sole aim of exertion, it is excellently well attained. Nature and mankind are turned to the best pecuniary advantage, and society is dexterously made to contribute to the welfare of each of its members, whilst individual egotism is the source of general happiness. The citizen of the North has not only experience but knowledge. Nevertheless, he sets but little value upon the pleasures of knowledge, he esteems it as the means of attaining a certain end, and he is only anxious to seize its more lucrative applications. The citizen of the South is more given to act upon impulse. He is more clever, more frank, more generous, more intellectual, and more brilliant. The former, with a greater degree of activity, of common sense, of information, and of general aptitude, has the characteristic good and evil qualities of the middle class. The latter has the tastes, the prejudices, the weaknesses, and the magnanimity of all aristocracies. If two men are united in society who have the same interests, and to a certain extent the same opinions, but different characters, different acquirements, and a different style of civilization, it is probable that these men will not agree. The same remark is applicable to a society of nations. Slavery, then, does not attack the American Union directly in its interests, but indirectly in its manners. The states which gave their assent to the federal contract in 1790 were thirteen in number. The Union now consists of thirty-four members. The population, which amounted to nearly four million in 1790, had more than tripled in the space of forty years, and in 1830 it amounted to nearly thirteen million. Changes of such magnitude cannot take place without some danger. A society of nations, as well as a society of individuals, derives its principal chances of duration from the wisdom of its members, their individual weaknesses, and their limited number. 
the americans who quit the coasts of the atlantic ocean to plunge into the western wilderness are adventurers impatient of restraint greedy of wealth and frequently men expelled from the states in which they were born when they arrive in the deserts they are unknown to each other and they have neither traditions family feeling nor the force of example to check their excesses the empire of the laws is feeble amongst them that of morality is still more powerless the settlers who are constantly peopling the valley of the mississippi are then in every respect very inferior to the americans who inhabit the older parts of the union nevertheless they already exercise a great influence in its councils and they arrive at the government of the commonwealth before they have learnt to govern themselves the greater the individual weakness of each of the contracting parties the greater are the chances of the duration of the contract for their safety is then dependent upon their union when in seventeen ninety the most populous of the american republics did not contain five hundred thousand inhabitants each of them felt its own insignificance as an independent people and this feeling rendered compliance with the federal authority more easy but when one of the confederate states reckons like the state of new york two million of inhabitants and covers an extent of territory equal in surface to a quarter of france it feels its own strength and although it may continue to support the union as advantageous to its prosperity it no longer regards that body as necessary to its existence and as it continues to belong to the federal compact it soon aims at preponderance in the federal assemblies the probable unanimity of the states is diminished as their number increases at present the interests of the different parts of the union are not at variance but who is able to foresee the multifarious changes of the future in a country in which towns are founded from day to day and states almost from year to year since the first settlement of the british colonies the number of inhabitants has about doubled every twenty-two years i perceive no causes which are likely to check this progressive increase of the anglo-american population for the next hundred years and before that space of time has elapsed i believe that the territories and dependencies of the united states will be covered by more than one hundred million of inhabitants and divided into forty states i admit that these one hundred million of men have no hostile interests i suppose on the contrary that they are all equally interested in the maintenance of the union but i am still of opinion that where there are one hundred million of men and forty distinct nations unequally strong the continuance of the federal government can only be a fortunate accident whatever faith i may have in the perfectibility of man until human nature is altered and men wholly transformed i shall refuse to believe in the duration of a government which is called upon to hold together forty different peoples disseminated over a territory equal to one-half of europe in extent to avoid all rivalry ambition and struggles between them and to direct their independent activity to the accomplishment of the same designs but the greatest peril to which the union is exposed by its increase arises from the continual changes which take place in the position of its internal strength the distance from lake superior to the gulf of mexico extends from the forty-seventh to the thirtieth degree of latitude a distance of more than twelve hundred miles as the bird flies the frontier of the united states winds along the whole of this immense line sometimes falling within its limits but more frequently extending far beyond it into the waste it has been calculated that the whites advance every year at a mean distance of seventeen miles along the whole of this vast boundary obstacles such as an unproductive district a lake or an indian nation unexpectedly encountered are sometimes met with the advancing column then halts for a while its two extremities fall back upon themselves and as soon as they are reunited they proceed onwards this gradual and continuous progress of the european race towards the rocky mountains has the solemnity of a providential event it is like a deluge of men rising unabatedly and daily driven onwards by the hand of god within this first line of conquering settlers towns are built and vast states founded in 1790 there were only a few thousand pioneers sprinkled along the valleys of the mississippi and at the present day these valleys contain as many inhabitants as were to be found in the whole union in 1790 their population amounts to nearly four million the city of washington was founded in 1800 in the very centre of the union but such are the changes which have taken place 
that it now stands at one of the extremities, and the delegates of the most remote western states are already obliged to perform a journey as long as that from Vienna to Paris. All the states are borne onwards at the same time in the path of fortune, but of course they do not all increase and prosper in the same proportion. To the north of the Union the detached branches of the Allegheny chain, which extend as far as the Atlantic Ocean, form spacious roads and ports, which are constantly accessible to vessels of the greatest burden. But from the Potomac to the mouth of the Mississippi the coast is sandy and flat. In this part of the Union the mouths of almost all the rivers are obstructed, and the few harbors which exist amongst these lagoons afford much shallower water to vessels, and much fewer commercial advantages than those of the north. This first natural cause of inferiority is united to another cause proceeding from the laws. We have already seen that slavery, which is abolished in the north, still exists in the south, and I have pointed out its fatal consequences upon the prosperity of the planter himself. The North is therefore superior to the South both in commerce and manufacture, the natural consequence of which is the more rapid increase of population and of wealth within its borders. The states situate upon the shores of the Atlantic Ocean are already half peopled. Most of the land is held by an owner, and these districts cannot therefore receive so many emigrants as the western states, where a boundless field is still open to their exertions. The valley of the Mississippi is far more fertile than the coast of the Atlantic Ocean. This reason, added to all the others, contributes to drive the Europeans westward, a fact which may be rigorously demonstrated by figures. It is found that the sum total of the population of all the United States has about tripled in the course of forty years. But in the recent states adjacent to the Mississippi, the population has increased thirty-one-fold within the same space of time. The relative position of the central federal power is continually displaced. Forty years ago the majority of the citizens of the Union was established upon the coast of the Atlantic, in the environs of the spot upon which Washington now stands. But the great body of the people is now advancing inland and to the north, so that in twenty years the majority will unquestionably be on the western side of the Alleghanies. If the Union goes on to subsist, the basin of the Mississippi is evidently marked out, by its fertility and its extent, as the future center of the federal government. In thirty or forty years that tract of country will have assumed the rank which naturally belongs to it. It is easy to calculate that its population, compared to that of the coast of the Atlantic, will be, in round numbers, as forty to eleven. In a few years the states which founded the Union will lose the direction of its policy, and the population of the valley of the Mississippi will preponderate in the federal assemblies. This constant gravitation of the federal power and influence towards the northwest is shown every ten years, when a general census of the population is made, and the number of delegates which each state sends to Congress is settled afresh. In 1790 Virginia had nineteen representatives in Congress. This number continued to increase until the year 1830, when it reached to twenty-three. From that time it began to decrease, and in 1833 Virginia elected only twenty-one representatives. During the same period the state of New York progressed in the contrary direction. In 1790 it had ten representatives in Congress, in 1813 twenty-seven, in 1823 thirty-four, and in 1833 forty. The state of Ohio had only one representative in 1803, and in 1833 it had already nineteen. End of section thirty-nine. Section 40. Chapter 18. Future Condition of Three Races. Part 8. It is difficult to imagine a durable union of a people which is rich and strong, with one which is poor and weak, even if it were proved that the strength and wealth of the one are not the causes of the weakness and poverty of the other. But the union is still more difficult to maintain at a time at which one party is losing strength, and the other is gaining it. This rapid and disproportionate increase of certain states threatens the independence of the others. New York might perhaps succeed, with its two million of inhabitants and its forty representatives, in dictating to the other states in Congress. 
But even if the more powerful states make no attempt to bear down the lesser ones, the danger still exists, for there is almost as much in the possibility of the act as in the act itself. The weak generally mistrust the justice and reason of the strong. The states which increase the less rapidly than the others look upon those which are more favored by fortune with envy and suspicion. Hence arise the deep-seated uneasiness and the ill-defined agitation which are observable in the South, and which form so striking a contrast to the confidence and prosperity which are common to the other parts of the Union. I am inclined to think that the hostile measures taken by the southern provinces upon a recent occasion are attributable to no other cause. The inhabitants of the southern states are, of all the Americans, those who are most interested in the maintenance of the Union. They would assuredly suffer most from being left to themselves, and yet they are the only citizens who threaten to break the tie of confederation. But it is easy to perceive that the South, which has given four presidents, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, to the Union, which perceives that it is losing its federal influence, and that the number of its representatives in Congress is diminishing from year to year, whilst those of the northern and western states are increasing. The South, which is peopled with ardent and irascible beings, is becoming more and more irritated and alarmed. The citizens reflect upon their present position and remember their past influence, with the melancholy uneasiness of men who suspect oppression, if they discover a law of the Union which is not unequivocally favorable to their interests, they protest against it as an abuse of force, and if their ardent remonstrances are not listened to, they threaten to quit an association which loads them with burdens, whilst it deprives them of their due profits. The tariff, said the inhabitants of Carolina in 1832, enriches the North and ruins the South, for if this were not the case, to what can we attribute the continually increasing power and wealth of the North, with its inclement skies and arid soil, whilst the South, which may be styled the Garden of America, is rapidly declining? If the changes which I have described were gradual, so that each generation at least might have time to disappear with the order of things under which it had lived, the danger would be less but the progress of society in America is precipitate, and almost revolutionary. The same citizen may have lived to see his state take the lead in the Union, and afterwards become powerless in the Federal Assemblies, and an Anglo-American Republic has been known to grow as rapidly as a man passing from birth and infancy to maturity in the course of thirty years. It must not be imagined, however, that the states which lose their preponderance also lose their population or their riches. No stop is put to their prosperity, and they even go on to increase more rapidly than any kingdom in Europe. But they believe themselves to be impoverished because their wealth does not augment as rapidly as that of their neighbors, and they think that their power is lost, because they suddenly come into collision with a power greater than their own. Thus they are more hurt in their feelings and their passions than in their interests. But this is amply sufficient to endanger the maintenance of the Union. If kings and peoples had only their true interests in view ever since the beginning of the world, the name of war would scarcely be known among mankind. Thus the prosperity of the United States is the source of the most serious dangers that threaten them, since it tends to create in some of the Confederate states that over-excitement which accompanies a rapid increase of fortune, and to awaken in others those feelings of envy, mistrust, and regret which usually attend upon the loss of it. The Americans contemplate this extraordinary and hasty progress with exultation, but they would be wiser to consider it with sorrow and alarm. The Americans of the United States must inevitably become one of the greatest nations in the world, their offset will cover almost the whole of North America, the continent which they inhabit is their dominion, and it cannot escape them. What urges them to take possession of it so soon? Riches, power, and renown cannot fail to be theirs at some future time, but they rush upon their fortune as if but a moment remained for them to make it their own. I think that I have demonstrated that the existence of the present Confederation depends entirely on the continued ascent of all the Confederates. And starting from this principle, I have inquired into the causes which may induce the several states to separate from the others. 
The Union may, however, perish in two different ways. One of the Confederate States may choose to retire from the compact, and so forcibly to sever the federal tie, and it is to this supposition that most of the remarks that I have made apply. Or the authority of the federal government may be progressively entrenched on by the simultaneous tendency of the United Republics to resume their independence. The central power, successively stripped of all its prerogatives, and reduced to impotence by tacit consent, would become incompetent to fulfill its purpose, and the second union would perish, like the first, by a sort of senile inaptitude. The gradual weakening of the federal tie, which may finally lead to the dissolution of the union, is a distinct circumstance, that may produce a variety of minor consequences before it operates so violent a change the confederation might still subsist, although its government were reduced to such a degree of inanition as to paralyze the nation, to cause internal anarchy, and to check the general prosperity of the country. After having investigated the causes which may induce the Anglo-Americans to disunite, it is important to inquire whether, if the Union continues to subsist, their government will extend or contract its sphere of action, and whether it will become more energetic or more weak. The Americans are evidently disposed to look upon their future condition with alarm. They perceive that in most of the nations of the world the exercise of the rights of sovereignty tends to fall under the control of a few individuals, and they are dismayed by the idea that such will also be the case in their own country. Even the statesmen feel, or affect to feel, these fears. For, in America, centralization is by no means popular and there is no surer means of courting the majority than by inveighing against the encroachments of the central power. The Americans do not perceive that the countries in which this alarming tendency to centralization exists are inhabited by a single people, whilst the fact of the Union being so composed of different Confederate communities is sufficient to battle all the interferences which might be drawn from analogous circumstances. I confess that I am inclined to consider the fears of a great number of Americans as purely imaginary, and far from participating in their dread of the consolidation of power in the hands of the Union, I think that the Federal Government is visibly losing strength. To prove this assertion, I shall not have recourse to any remote occurrences, but to circumstances which I have myself witnessed, and which belong to our own time. An attentive examination of what is going on in the United States will easily convince us that two opposite tendencies exist in that country, like two distinct currents flowing in contrary directions in the same channel. The Union has now existed for forty-five years, and in the course of that time a vast number of provincial prejudices, which were at first hostile to its power, have died away. The patriotic feeling which attended each of the Americans to his own native state is becoming less exclusive, and the different parts of the Union have become more intimately connected, the better they have become acquainted with each other. The post, that great instrument of intellectual intercourse, now reaches into the backwoods, and steamboats have established daily means of communication between the different points of the coast. An inland navigation of unexampled rapidity conveys commodities up and down the rivers of the country, and to these facilities of nature and art may be added those restless cravings, that busy-mindedness and love of perf, which are constantly urging the Americans into active life, and bringing him into contact with his fellow citizens. He crosses the country in every direction, he visits all the various populations of the land, and there is not a province in France in which the natives are so well known to each other as the thirteen million of men who cover the territory of the United States. But whilst the Americans intermingle, they grow in resemblance of each other. The differences resulting from their climate, their origin, and their institutions diminish, and they all draw nearer and nearer to the common type. Every year thousands of men leave the North to settle in different parts of the Union. They bring with them their faith, their opinions, and their manners, and as they are more enlightened than the men amongst whom they are about to dwell, they soon rise to the head of affairs, and they adapt society to their own advantage. This continual emigration of the north to the south is peculiarly favorable to the fusion of all the different provincial characters into one national character. 
the civilization of the North appears to be the common standard, to which the whole nation will one day be assimilated. The commercial ties which unite the Confederate States are strengthened by the increasing manufactures of the Americans, and the union which began to exist in their opinions gradually forms a part of their habits. The course of time has swept away the bugbear thoughts which haunted the imaginations of the citizens in 1789. The federal power is not become oppressive. It has not destroyed the independence of the states. It has not subjected the Confederates to monarchical institutions, and the Union has not rendered the lesser states dependent upon the larger ones. But the Confederation has continued to increase in population, in wealth, and in power. I am therefore convinced that the natural obstacles to the continuance of the American Union are not so powerful at the present time as they were in 1789, and that the enemies of the Union are not so numerous. Nevertheless, a careful examination of the history of the United States for the last forty-five years will readily convince us that the federal power is declining, nor is it difficult to explain the causes of this phenomenon. When the Constitution of 1789 was promulgated, the nation was a prey to anarchy. The Union, which succeeded this confusion, excited much dread and much animosity. But it was warmly supported because it satisfied an imperious want— Thus, although it was more attacked than it is now, the federal power soon reached the maximum of its authority, as is usually the case with a government which triumphs after having braced its strength by the struggle. At that time the interpretation of the Constitution seemed to extend, rather than to repress, the federal sovereignty, and the Union offered in several respects the appearance of a single and undivided people, directed in its foreign and internal policy by a single government. But to attain this point the people had risen, to a certain extent, above itself. The Constitution had not destroyed the distinct sovereignty of the states, and all communities, of whatever nature they may be, are impelled by a secret propensity to assert their independence. This propensity is still more decided in a country like America, in which every village forms a sort of republic accustomed to conduct its own affairs. It therefore cost the states an effort to submit to the federal supremacy, and all efforts, however successful they may be, necessarily subside with the causes in which they originated. As the federal government consolidated its authority, America resumed its rank amongst the nations. Peace returned to its frontiers, and public credit was restored. Confusion was succeeded by a fixed state of things, which was favorable to the full and free exercise of industrious enterprise. It was this very prosperity which made the Americans forget the cause to which it was attributable, and when once the danger was past, the energy and the patriotism which had enabled them to brave it disappeared from amongst them. No sooner were they delivered from the cares which oppressed them, than they easily returned to their ordinary habits, and gave themselves up without resistance to their natural inclinations. When a powerful government no longer appeared to be necessary, they once more began to think it irksome. The Union encouraged a general prosperity, and the states were not inclined to abandon the Union, but they desired to render the action of the power which represented that body as light as possible. The general principle of Union was adopted, but in every minor detail there was an actual tendency to independence. The principle of Confederation was every day more easily admitted, and more rarely applied so that the federal government brought about its own decline whilst it was creating order and peace. As soon as this tendency of public opinion began to be manifested externally, the leaders of parties who live by the passions of the people began to work it to their own advantage. The position of the federal government then became exceedingly critical. Its enemies were in possession of the popular favor, and they obtained the right of conducting its policy by pledging themselves to lessen its influence. From that time forwards the government of the Union has invariably been obliged to recede, as often as it has attempted to enter the lists with the government of the states. And whenever an interpretation of the terms of the federal constitution has been called for, that interpretation has most frequently been opposed to the Union, and favorable to the states. The constitution invested the federal government with the right of providing for the interests of the nation, and it had been held that no other authority was so fit to superintend the internal improvements which affected the prosperity of the whole Union. 
such, for instance, as the cutting of canals. But the states were alarmed at a power, distinct from their own, which could thus dispose of a portion of their territory, and they were afraid that the central government would, by this means, acquire a formidable extent of patronage within their own confines, and exercise a degree of influence which they intended to reserve exclusively to their own agents. The Democratic Party, which has constantly been opposed to the increase of the federal authority, then accused the Congress of usurpation, and the chief magistrate of ambition. The central government was intimidated by the opposition, and it soon acknowledged its error, promising exactly to confine its influence for the future within the circle which was prescribed to it. The Constitution confers upon the Union the right of treating with foreign nations. The Indian tribes which border upon the frontiers of the United States had usually been regarded in this light. As long as these savages consented to retire before the civilized settlers, the federal right was not contested. But as soon as the Indian tribe attempted to fix its dwelling upon a given spot, the adjacent states claimed possession of the lands and the rights of sovereignty over the natives. The central government soon recognized both these claims, and, after it had concluded treaties with the Indians as independent nations, it gave them up as subjects to the legislative tyranny of the states. Some of the states which had been founded upon the coast of the Atlantic extended indefinitely to the west, into wild regions where no European had ever penetrated. The state whose confines were irrevocably fixed looked with a jealous eye upon the unbounded regions which the future would enable their neighbors to explore. The latter then agreed, with a view to conciliate the others, and to facilitate the act of union, to lay down their own boundaries, and to abandon all the territory which lay beyond those limits to the Confederation at large. Thenceforward the Federal Government became the owner of all the uncultivated lands which lie beyond the borders of the thirteen states first confederated. It was invested with the right of parceling and selling them, and the sums derived from this source were exclusively reserved to the public treasure of the Union, in order to furnish supplies for purchasing tracts of country from the Indians, for opening roads to the remote settlements, and for accelerating the increase of civilization as much as possible. New states have, however, been formed in the course of time, in the midst of those wilds which were formerly ceded by the inhabitants of the shores of the Atlantic. Congress has gone on to sell, for the profit of the nation at large, the uncultivated lands which those new states contained. But the latter at length asserted that, as they were now fully constituted, they ought to enjoy the exclusive right of converting the produce of these sales to their own use. As their remonstrances became more and more threatening, Congress thought fit to deprive the Union of a portion of the privileges which it had hitherto enjoyed, and at the end of 1832 it passed a law by which the greatest part of the revenue derived from the sale of lands was made over to the new western republics, although the lands themselves were not ceded to them. The slightest observation in the United States enables one to appreciate the advantage which the country derives from the bank. These advantages are of several kinds, but one of them is peculiarly striking to the stranger. The bank notes of the United States are taken upon the borders of the desert for the same value as at Philadelphia, where the bank conducts its operations. The bank of the United States is nevertheless the object of great animosity. Its directors have proclaimed their hostility to the President, and they are accused, not without some show of probability, of having abused their influence to thwart his election. The President, therefore, attacks the establishment which they represent with all the warmth of personal enmity, and he is encouraged in the pursuit of his revenge by the conviction that he is supported by the secret propensities of the majority. The bank may be regarded as the great monetary tie of the Union, just as Congress is the great legislative tie, and the same passions which tend to render the states independent of the central power contribute to the overthrow of the bank. The Bank of the United States always holds a great number of the notes issued by the provincial banks, which it can at any time oblige them to convert into cash. It has itself nothing to fear from a similar demand, as the extent of its resources enables it to meet all claims. But the existence of the provincial banks is thus threatened, and their operations are restricted, since they are only able to issue a quantity of notes duly proportioned to their capital. 
they submit with impatience to this salutary control. The newspapers which they have bought over, and the President, whose interest renders them their instrument, attack the bank with the greatest vehemence. They rouse the local passions and the blind democratic instinct of the country to aid their cause, and they assert that the bank directors form a permanent aristocratic body, whose influence must ultimately be felt in the government, and must affect those principles of equality upon which society rests in America. The contest between the bank and its opponents is only an incident in the great struggle which is going on in America between the provinces and the central power between the spirit of democratic independence and the spirit of gradation and subordination. I do not mean that the enemies of the bank are identically the same individuals who, on other points, attack the federal government, but I assert that the attacks directed against the Bank of the United States originate in the same propensities, which mitigate against the federal government, and that the very numerous opponents of the former afford a deplorable symptom of the decreasing support of the latter. The Union has never displayed so much weakness as in the celebrated question of the tariff. The wars of the French Revolution and of 1812 had created manufacturing establishments in the north of the Union by cutting off all free communication between America and Europe. When peace was concluded and the channel of intercourse reopened by which the produce of Europe was transmitted to the New World, the Americans thought fit to establish a system of import duties, for the twofold purpose of protecting their incipient manufactures and of paying off the amount of the debt contracted during the war. The southern states, which have no manufactures to encourage, and which are exclusively agricultural, soon complained of this measure. Such were the simple facts, and I do not pretend to examine in this place whether their complaints were well-founded or unjust. As early as the year 1820, South Carolina declared, in a petition to Congress, that the tariff was unconstitutional, oppressive, and unjust. And the states of Georgia, Virginia, North Carolina, Alabama, and Mississippi subsequently remonstrated against it, with more or less vigor. But Congress, far from lending an ear to these complaints, raised the scale of the tariff duties in the years 1824 and 1828, and recognized anew the principle on which it was founded. A doctrine was then proclaimed, or rather revived, in the South, which took the name of nullification. I have shown in the proper place that the object of the Federal Constitution was not to form a league, but to create a national government. The Americans of the United States form a sole and undivided people, in all the cases which are specified by that Constitution, and upon these points the will of the nation is expressed, as it is in all constitutional nations, by the voice of the majority. When the majority has pronounced its decision, it is the duty of the minority to submit. Such is the sound legal doctrine, and the only one which agrees with the text of the Constitution, and the known intention of those who framed it. The partisans of nullification in the South maintain, on the contrary, that the intention of the Americans in uniting was not to reduce themselves to the condition of one and the same people, that they meant to constitute a league of independent states, and that each state, consequently, retains its entire sovereignty, if not de facto, at least de jure, and has the right of putting its own construction upon the laws of Congress and of suspending their execution within the limits of its own territory, if they are held to be unconstitutional and unjust. The entire doctrine of nullification is comprised in a sentence uttered by Vice President Calhoun, the head of that party in the South, before the Senate of the United States in the year 1833. Could. The Constitution is a compact to which the states were parties in their sovereign capacity. Now, whenever a compact is entered into by parties which acknowledge no tribunal above their authority to decide in the last resort, each of them has a right to judge for itself in relation to the nature, extent, and obligations of the instrument. It is evident that a similar doctrine destroys the very basis of the Federal Constitution and brings back all the evils of the old Confederation, from which the Americans were supposed to have had a safe deliverance. When South Carolina perceived that Congress turned a deaf ear to its remonstrances, it threatened to apply the doctrine of nullification to the Federal Tariff Bill. 
Congress persisted in its former system, and at length the storm broke out. In the course of 1832, the citizens of South Carolina named a national convention to consult upon the extraordinary measures which they were called upon to take, and on November 24th of the same year, this convention promulgated a law, under the form of a decree, which annulled the federal law of the tariff, forbade the levy of the imposts which that law commands, and refused to recognize the appeal which might be made to the federal courts of law. This decree was only to be put in execution in the ensuing month of February, and it was intimated that if Congress modified the tariff before that period, South Carolina might be induced to proceed no further with her menaces, and a vague desire was afterwards expressed of submitting the question to an extraordinary assembly of all the Confederate States. End of section 40section forty one chapter eighteen future condition of three races part nine in the meantime south carolina armed her militia and prepared for war but congress which had slighted its suppliant subjects listened to their complaints as soon as they were found to have taken up arms a law was passed by which the tariff duties were to be progressively reduced for ten years until they were brought so low as to not exceed the amount of supplies necessary to the government. Thus Congress completely abandoned the principle of the tariff, and substituted a mere fiscal impost to a system of protective duties. The government of the Union, in order to conceal its defeat, had recourse to an expedient which is very much in vogue with feeble governments. It yielded the point de facto, but it remained inflexible upon the principles in question, and whilst Congress was altering the tariff law, it passed another bill, by which the President was invested with extraordinary powers, enabling him to overcome by force a resistance which was then no longer to be apprehended. But South Carolina did not consent to leave the Union in the enjoyment of these scanty trophies of success. The same national convention which had annulled the tariff bill met again, and accepted the proffered concession, but at the same time it declared it unabated perseverance in the doctrine of nullification, and to prove what it said it annulled the law investing the President with extraordinary powers, although it was very certain that the clauses of that law would never be carried into effect. Almost all the controversies of which I have been speaking have taken place under the presidency of General Jackson, and it cannot be denied that in the question of the tariff he has supported the claims of the Union with vigor and with skill. I am, however, of the opinion that the conduct of the individual who now represents the federal government may be reckoned as one of the dangers which threaten its continuance. Some persons in Europe have formed an opinion of the possible influence of General Jackson upon the affairs of his country, which appears highly extravagant to those who have seen more of the subject. We have been told that General Jackson has won sundry battles that he is an energetic man, prone by nature and by habit to the use of force, covetous of power, and a despot by taste. All this may perhaps be true, but the inferences which have been drawn from these truths are exceedingly erroneous. It has been imagined that General Jackson is bent on establishing a dictatorship in America, on introducing a military spirit, and on giving a degree of influence to the central authority which cannot but be dangerous to provincial liberties. But in America the time for similar undertakings, and the age for men of this kind, is not yet come. If General Jackson had entertained a hope of exercising his authority in this matter, he would infallibly have forfeited his political station, and compromised his life. Accordingly he has not been so imprudent as to make any such attempt. Far from wishing to extend the federal power, the President belongs to the party which is desirous of limiting that power to the bare and precise letter of the Constitution, and which never puts a construction upon that act favorable to the government of the Union. Far from standing forth as the champion of centralization, General Jackson is the agent of all the jealousies of the states, and he was placed in the lofty station he occupies by the passions of the people which are most opposed to the central government. It is by perpetually flattering these passions that he maintains his station and his popularity. General Jackson is the slave of the majority. 
he yields to its wishes, its propensities, and its demands. Say rather that he anticipates and forestalls them. Whenever the governments of the states come into collision with that of the Union, the President is generally the first to question his own rights. He almost always outstrips the legislature, and when the extent of the federal power is controverted, he takes part, as it were, against himself. He conceals his official interests, and extinguishes his own natural inclinations. Not indeed that he is naturally weak or hostile to the Union, for when the majority decided against the claims of the partisans of nullification, he put himself at its head, asserted the doctrines which the nation held distinctly and energetically, and was the first to recommend forcible measures. But General Jackson appears to me, if I may use the American expression, to be a Federalist by taste and a Republican by calculation. General Jackson stoops to gain the favor of the majority, but when he feels that his popularity is secure, he overthrows all obstacles in pursuit of the objects which the community approves, or of those which it does not look upon with a jealous eye. He is supported by a power with which his predecessors were unacquainted, and he tramples on his personal enemies whenever they cross his path with a faculty which no former president ever enjoyed. He takes upon himself the responsibility of measures which no one before him would have ventured to attempt. He even treats the national representatives with disdain approaching to insult. He puts his veto upon the laws of Congress, and frequently neglects to reply to that powerful body. He is a favorite who sometimes treats his master roughly. The power of General Jackson perpetually increases, but that of the President declines. In his hands the federal government is strong, but it will pass enfeebled into the hands of his successor. I am strangely mistaken if the federal government of the United States be not constantly losing strength, retiring gradually from public affairs, and narrowing its circle of action more and more. It is naturally feeble, but it now abandons even its pretensions to strength. On the other hand, I thought that I remarked a more lively sense of independence, and a more decided attachment to provincial government in the States. The Union is to subsist, but to subsist is a shadow. It is to be strong in certain cases, and weak in all others. In time of warfare, it is to be able to concentrate all the forces of the nation, and all the resources of the country in its hands, and in time of peace its existence is to be scarcely perceptible, as if this alternate debility and vigor were natural or possible. I do not foresee anything for the present which may be able to check this general impulse of public opinion. The causes in which it originated do not cease to operate with the same effect. The change will therefore go on, and it may be predicted that, unless some extraordinary event occurs, the government of the Union will grow weaker and weaker every day. I think, however, that the period is still remote at which the federal power will be entirely extinguished by its inability to protect itself and to maintain peace in the country. The Union is sanctioned by the manners and desires of the people. Its results are palpable, its benefits visible. When it is perceived that the weakness of the federal government compromises the existence of the Union, I do not doubt that a reaction will take place with a view to increase its strength. The government of the United States is, of all the federal governments which have hitherto been established, the one which is most naturally destined to act. As long as it is only indirectly assailed by the interpretation of its laws, and as long as its substance is not seriously altered, a change of opinion, an internal crisis, or a war, may restore all the vigor which it requires. The point which I have been most anxious to put in a clear light is simply this. Many people, especially in France, imagine that a change in opinion is going on in the United States, which is favorable to a centralization of power in the hands of the President and the Congress. I hold that a contrary tendency may distinctly be observed. So far as the federal government from acquiring strength, and from threatening the sovereignty of the states as it grows older, that I maintain it to be growing weaker and weaker, and that the sovereignty of the Union alone is in danger. Such are the facts which the present time discloses. The future conceals the final result of this tendency, and the events which may check, retard, or accelerate the changes I have described, but I do not affect to be able to remove the veil which hides them from our sight. Of the Republican Institutions of the United States, and what their chances of duration are. 
the dismemberment of the union by the introduction of war into the heart of those states which are now confederate with standing armies a dictatorship and a heavy taxation might eventually compromise the fate of the republican institutions but we ought not to confound the future prospects of the republic with those of the union the union is an accident which will only last as long as circumstances are favorable to its existence but a republican form of government seems to me to be the natural state of the americans which nothing but the continued action of hostile causes always acting in the same direction could change into a monarchy the union exists principally in the law which formed it one revolution one change in public opinion might destroy it for ever but the republic has a much deeper foundation to rest upon what is understood by a republican government in the united states is the slow and quiet action of society upon itself it is a regular state of things really founded upon the enlightened will of the people it is a conciliatory government under which resolutions are allowed time to ripen and in which they are deliberately discussed and executed with mature judgment the republicans in the united states set a high value upon morality respect religious belief and acknowledge the existence of rights they profess to think that a people ought to be moral religious and temperate in proportion as it is free what is called the republic in the united states is the tranquil rule of the majority which after having had time to examine itself and to give proof of its existence is the common source of all the powers of the state but the power of the majority is not of itself unlimited in the moral world humanity justice and reason enjoy an undisputed supremacy in the political world vested rights are treated with no less deference the majority recognizes these two barriers and if it now and then overstep them it is because like individuals it has passions and like them it is prone to do what is wrong whilst it discerns what is right but the demagogues of europe have made strange discoveries a republic is not according to them the rule of the majority as has hitherto been thought but the rule of those who are strenuous partisans of the majority it is not the people who preponderates in this kind of government but those who are best versed in the good qualities of the people a happy distinction which allows men to act in the name of nations without consulting them and to claim their gratitude whilst their rights are spurned a republican government moreover is the only one which claims the right of doing whatever it chooses and despising what men have hitherto respected from the highest moral obligations to the vulgar rules of common sense it had been supposed until our time that despotism was odious under whatever form it appeared but it is a discovery of modern days that there are such things as legitimate tyranny and holy injustice provided they are exercised in the name of the people the ideas which the americans have adopted respecting the republican form of government render it easy for them to live under it and ensure its duration if in their country this form be often practically bad at least it is theoretically good and in the end the people always acts in conformity to it it was impossible at the foundation of the states and it would still be difficult to establish a central administration in america the inhabitants are dispersed over too great a space and separated by too many natural obstacles for one man to undertake to direct the details of their existence america is therefore preeminently the country of provincial and municipal government to this cause which was plainly felt by all the europeans of the new world the anglo-americans added several others peculiar to themselves at the time of the settlement of the north american colonies municipal liberty had already penetrated into the laws as well as the manners of the english and the emigrants adopted it not only as a necessary thing but as a benefit which they knew how to appreciate we have already seen the manner in which the colonies were founded every province and almost every district was peopled separately by men who were strangers to each other or who associated with very different purposes the english settlers in the united states therefore early perceived that they were divided into a great number of small and distinct communities which belonged to no common center and that it was needful for each of these little communities to take care of its own affairs since there did not appear to be any central authority which was naturally bound and easily enabled to provide for them 
Thus the nature of the country, the manner in which the British colonies were founded, the habits of the first emigrants, in short everything, united to promote, in an extraordinary degree, municipal and provincial liberties. In the United States, therefore, the mass of the institutions of the country is essentially republican, and in order permanently to destroy the laws which form the basis of the republic, it would be necessary to abolish all the laws at once. At the present day it would be even more difficult for a party to succeed in founding a monarchy in the United States than for a set of men to proclaim that France should henceforward be a republic. Royalty would not find a system of legislation prepared for it beforehand, and a monarchy would then exist really surrounded by republican institutions. The monarchical principle would likewise have great difficulty in penetrating into the manners of the Americans. In the United States the sovereignty of the people is not an isolated doctrine bearing no relation to the prevailing manners and ideas of the people. It may, on the contrary, be regarded as the last link of a chain of opinions which binds the whole Anglo-American world. That Providence has given to every human being the degree of reason necessary to direct himself in the affairs which interest him exclusively, such is the grand maxim upon which civil and political society rests in the United States. The father of a family applies it to his children, the master to his servants, the township to its officers, the province to its townships, the state to its provinces, the union to the states, and when extended to the nation it becomes the doctrine of the sovereignty of the people. Thus in the United States the fundamental principle of the republic is the same which governs the greater part of human actions. The republican notions insinuate themselves into all the ideas, opinions, and habits of the Americans, whilst they are formally recognized by the legislation. And before this legislation can be altered, the whole community must undergo very serious changes. In the United States, even the religion of most of the citizens is republican, since it submits the truths of the other world to private judgment, as in politics the care of its temporal interests is abandoned to the good sense of the people. Thus every man is allowed freely to take that road which he thinks will lead him to heaven, just as the law permits every citizen to have the right of choosing his government. It is evident that nothing but a long series of events, all having the same tendency, can substitute for this combination of laws, opinions, and manners, a mass of opposite opinions, manners, and laws. If republican principles are to perish in America, they can only yield after a laborious social process, often interrupted, and as often resumed. They will have many apparent revivals, and will not become totally extinct until an entirely new people shall have succeeded to that which now exists. Now it must be admitted that there is no symptom or presage of the approach of such a revolution. There is nothing more striking to a person newly arrived in the United States than the kind of tumultuous agitation in which he finds political society. The laws are incessantly changing, and at first sight it seems impossible that a people so variable in its desires should avoid adopting, within a short space of time, a completely new form of government. Such apprehensions are, however, premature. The instability which affects political institutions is of two kinds, which ought not to be confounded. The first, which modifies secondary laws, is not incompatible with a very settled state of society. The other shakes the very foundations of the Constitution, and attacks the fundamental principles of legislation. This species of instability is always followed by troubles and revolutions, and the nation which suffers under it is in a state of violent transition. Experience shows that these two kinds of legislative instability have no necessary connection for they have been found united or separate according to times and circumstances. The first is common in the United States, but not the second. The Americans often change their laws, but the foundation of the Constitution is respected. In our days the Republican principle rules in America, as the monarchical principle did in France under Louis the Fourteenth. The French of that period were not only friends of the monarchy, but they thought it impossible to put anything in its place. They received it as we receive the rays of the sun and the return of the seasons. Amongst them the royal power had neither advocates nor opponents. In like manner does the republican government exist in America, 
without contention or opposition, without proofs and arguments, by a tacit agreement, a sort of consensus universalis. It is, however, my opinion that by changing their administrative forms as often as they do, the inhabitants of the United States compromise the future stability of their government. It may be apprehended that men, perpetually thwarted in their designs by the mutability of the legislation, will learn to look upon republican institutions as an inconvenient form of society. The evil resulting from the instability of the secondary enactments might then raise a doubt as to the nature of the fundamental principles of the Constitution, and indirectly bring about a revolution, but this epoch is still very remote. It may, however, be foreseen even now that when the Americans lose their republican institutions, they will speedily arrive at a despotic government, without a long interval of limited monarchy. Montesquieu remarked that nothing is more absolute than the authority of a prince who immediately succeeds a republic, since the powers which had fearlessly been entrusted to an elected magistrate are then transferred to a hereditary sovereign. This is true in general, but it is more peculiarly applicable to a democratic republic. In the United States, the magistrates are not elected by a particular class of citizens, but by the majority of the nation. They are the immediate representatives of the passions of the multitude, and as they are wholly dependent upon its pleasure, they excite neither hatred nor fear. Hence, as I have already shown, very little care has been taken to limit their influence and they are left in possession of a vast deal of arbitrary power. This state of things has engendered habits which would outlive itself. The American magistrate would retain his power, but he would cease to be responsible for the exercise of it, and it is impossible to say what bounds would then be set to tyranny. Some of our European politicians expect to see an aristocracy arise in America, and they already predict the exact period at which it would be able to assume the reins of government. I have previously observed, and I repeat my assertion, that the present tendency of American society appears to me to be more and more democratic. Nevertheless, I do not assert that the Americans will not, at some future time, restrict the circle of political rights in their country, or confiscate those rights to the advantage of a single individual. But I cannot imagine that they will ever bestow the exclusive exercise of them upon a privileged class of citizens, or, in other words, that they will ever found an aristocracy. An aristocratic body is composed of a certain number of citizens who, without being very far removed from the mass of the people, are, nevertheless, permanently stationed above it a body which it is easy to touch and difficult to strike, with which the people are in daily contact, but with which they can never combine. Nothing can be imagined more contrary to nature and to the secret propensities of the human heart than a subjection of this kind, and men who are left to follow their own bent will always prefer the arbitrary power of a king to the regular administration of an aristocracy." Aristocratic institutions cannot subsist without laying down the inequality of men as a fundamental principle, as a part and parcel of the legislation, affecting the condition of the human family as much as it affects that of society. But these are things so repugnant to natural equity that they can only be extorted from men by constraint. I do not think a single people can be quoted since human society began to exist which has, by its own free will and by its own exertions, created an aristocracy within its own bosom. All the aristocracies of the Middle Ages were founded by military conquest. The conqueror was the noble, the vanquished became the serf. Inequality was then imposed by force, and after it had been introduced into the manners of the country, it maintained its own authority and was sanctioned by the legislation. Communities have existed which were aristocratic from their earliest origin, owing to circumstances anterior to that event, and which became more democratic in each succeeding age. Such was the destiny of the Romans and of the barbarians after them. But a people having taken its rise in civilization and democracy, which should gradually establish an inequality of conditions until it arrived at invaluable privileges and exclusive castes, would be a novelty in the world and nothing intimates that America is likely to furnish so singular an example. Reflection on the Causes of the Commercial Prosperity of the United States 
The coast of the United States, from the Bay of Fundy to the Sabine River in the Gulf of Mexico, is more than two thousand miles in extent. These shores form an unbroken line, and they are all subject to the same government. No nation in the world possesses vaster, deeper, or more secure ports for shipping than the Americas. The inhabitants of the United States constitute a great civilized people, which fortune has placed in the midst of an uncultivated country at a distance of three thousand miles from the central point of civilization. America consequently stands in daily need of European trade. The Americans will, no doubt, ultimately succeed in producing or manufacturing at home most of the articles which they require. But the two continents can never be independent of each other. So numerous are the natural ties which exist between their wants, their ideas, their habits, and their manners. The Union produces peculiar commodities which are now become necessary to us, but which cannot be cultivated or can only be raised at enormous expense upon the soils of Europe. The Americans only consume a small portion of this produce, and they are willing to sell us the rest. Europe is therefore the market of America, as America is the market of Europe, and maritime commerce is no less necessary to enable the inhabitants of the United States to transport their raw materials to the ports of Europe, than it is to enable us to supply them with our manufactured produce. The United States were therefore necessarily reduced to the alternative of increasing the business of other maritime nations to a great extent, if they had themselves declined to enter into commerce, as the Spaniards of Mexico have hitherto done, or in the second place of becoming one of the first trading powers of the globe. The Anglo-Americans have always displayed a very decided taste for the sea. The Declaration of Independence broke the commercial restrictions which united them to England, and gave a fresh and powerful stimulus to their maritime genius. Ever since that time the shipping of the Union has increased in almost the same rapid proportion as the number of its inhabitants. The Americans themselves now transport to their own shores nine-tenths of the European produce which they consume, and they also bring three-quarters of the exports of the New World to the European consumer. The ships of the United States fill the docks of Havre and of Liverpool, whilst the number of English and French vessels which are to be seen at New York is comparatively small. Thus not only does the American merchant face the competition of his own countrymen, but he even supports that of foreign nations in their own ports with success. This is readily explained by the fact that the vessels of the United States can cross the seas at a cheaper rate than any other vessels in the world. As long as the mercantile shipping of the United States preserves this superiority, it will not only retain what it has acquired, but it will constantly increase in prosperity. End of section 41 Democracy in America Chapter 18 Part 10 It is difficult to say for what reason the Americans can trade at a lower rate than other nations, and one is at first led to attribute this circumstance to the physical or natural advantages which are within their reach. But this supposition is erroneous. The American vessels cost almost as much to build as our own. They are not better built, and they generally last for a shorter time. The pay of the American sailor is more considerable than the pay on board European ships, which is proved by the great number of Europeans who are to be met with in the merchant vessels of the United States. But I am of opinion that the true cause of their superiority must not be sought for in physical advantages, but that it is wholly attributable to their moral and intellectual qualities. The following comparison will illustrate my meaning. During the campaigns of the Revolution, the French introduced a new system of tactics into the art of war, which perplexed the oldest generals, and very nearly destroyed the most ancient monarchies in Europe. They undertook, what had never before been attempted, to make shift without a number of things which had always been held to be indispensable in warfare. They required novel exertions on the part of their troops which no civilized nations had ever thought of. They achieved great actions in an incredibly short space of time, and they risked human life without hesitation to obtain the object in view. The French had less money and fewer men than their enemies. Their resources were infinitely inferior. Nevertheless, they were constantly victorious, until their adversaries chose to imitate their example. 
The Americans have introduced a similar system into their commercial speculations, and they do for cheapness what the French did for conquest. The European sailor navigates with prudence, he only sets sail when the weather is favorable. If an unforeseen accident befalls him, he puts into port, at night he furls a portion of his canvas, and when the whitening billows intimate the vicinity of the land, he checks his way, and takes an observation of the sun. But the American neglects these precautions, and braves the dangers. He weighs anchor in the midst of tempestuous gales. By night and by day he spreads his sheets to the wind. He repairs, as he goes along, such damage as his vessel may have sustained from the storm, and when he at last approaches the term of his voyage, he darts onward to the shore as if he had already descried a port. The Americans are often shipwrecked, but no trader crosses the seas so rapidly, and as they perform the same distance in a shorter time, they can perform it at a cheaper rate. The European touches several times at different ports in the course of a long voyage. He loses a good deal of precious time in making the harbor, or in waiting for a favorable wind to leave it, and he pays daily dues to be allowed to remain there. The American starts from Boston to go to purchase tea in China. He arrives at Canton, stays there a few days, and then returns. In less than two years he has sailed as far as the entire circumference of the globe, and he has seen land but once. It is true that during a voyage of eight or ten months he has drunk brackish water and lived upon salt meat, that he has been in a continual contest with the sea, with disease, and with a tedious existence but upon his return he can sell a pound of his tea for half a penny less than the English merchant, and his purpose is accomplished. I cannot better explain my meaning than by saying that the Americans affect a sort of heroism in their manner of trading. But the European merchant will always find it very difficult to imitate his American competitor, who, in adopting the system which I have just described, follows not only a calculation of his gain, but an impulse of his nature." The inhabitants of the United States are subject to all the wants and all the desires which result from an advanced stage of civilization. But as they are not surrounded by a community admirably adapted, like that of Europe, to satisfy their wants, they are often obliged to procure for themselves the various articles which education and habit have rendered necessaries. In America it sometimes happens that the same individual tills his fields, builds his building, contrives his tools, makes his shoes, and weaves the coarse stuff of which his dress is composed. This circumstance is prejudicial to the excellence of the work, but it powerfully contributes to awaken the intelligence of the workman. Nothing tends to materialize man, and to deprive his work of the faintest trace of mind, more than extreme division of labor. In a country like America, where men devoted to special occupations are rare, a long apprenticeship cannot be required from any one who embraces the profession. The Americans, therefore, change their means of gaining a livelihood very readily, and they suit their occupations to the exigencies of the moment, in the manner most profitable to themselves. Men are to be met with who have successfully been barristers, farmers, merchants, ministers of the gospel, and physicians. If the American be less perfect in each craft than the European, at least there is scarcely any trade with which he is utterly unacquainted. His capacity is more general, and the circle of his intelligence is enlarged. The inhabitants of the United States are never fettered by the axioms of their profession. They escape from all the prejudices of their present station. They are not more attached to one line of operation than to another. They are not more prone to employ an old method than a new one. They have no rooted habits and they easily shake off the influence which the habits of other nations might exercise upon their minds, from a conviction that their country is unlike any other, and that its situation is without a precedent in the world. America is a land of wonders, in which everything is in constant motion, and every movement seems an improvement. The idea of novelty is there indissolubly connected with the idea of amelioration. No natural boundary seems to be set to the efforts of man, and what is not yet done is only what he has not yet attempted to do. This perpetual change which goes on in the United States, 
these frequent vicissitudes of fortune, accompanied by such unforeseen fluctuations in private and in public wealth, served to keep the minds of the citizens in a perpetual state of feverish agitation, which admirably invigorates their exertions, and keeps them in a state of excitement above the ordinary level of mankind. The whole life of an American is passed like a game of chance, a revolutionary crisis, or a battle. As the same causes are continually in operation throughout the country, they ultimately impart an irresistible impulse to the national character. The American, taken as a chance specimen of his countrymen, must then be a man of singular warmth in his desires, enterprising, fond of adventure, and, above all, of innovation. The same bent is manifest in all that he does. He introduces it into his political laws, his religious doctrines, his theories of social economy, and his domestic occupations. He bears it with him in the depths of the backwoods, as well as in the business of the city. It is the same passion applied to maritime commerce which makes him the cheapest and the quickest trader in the world. As long as the sailors of the United States retain these inspiring advantages, the practical superiority which they derive from them, they will not only continue to supply the wants of the producers and consumers of their own country, but they will tend more and more to become, like the English, the factors of all other peoples. This prediction has already begun to be realized. We perceive that the American traders are introducing themselves as intermediate agents in the commerce of several European nations, and America will offer a still wider field to their enterprise. The great colonies which were founded in South America by the Spaniards and the Portuguese have since become empires. Civil war and oppression now lay waste those extensive regions. Population does not increase, and the thinly scattered inhabitants are too much absorbed in the cares of self-defense to even attempt any amelioration of their condition. Such, however, will not always be the case. Europe has succeeded by her own efforts in piercing the gloom of the Middle Ages. South America has the same Christian laws and Christian manners as we have, she contains all the germs of civilization which have grown amidst the nations of Europe or their offsets, added to the advantages to be derived from our own example. Why, then, should she always remain uncivilized? It is clear that the question is simply one of time. At some future period, which may be more or less remote, the inhabitants of South America will constitute flourishing and enlightened nations." But when the Spaniards and Portuguese of South America begin to feel the wants common to all civilized nations, they will still be unable to satisfy those wants for themselves. As the youngest children of civilization, they must perforce admit the superiority of their elder brethren. They will be agriculturalists long before they succeed in manufactures or commerce, and they will require the mediation of strangers to exchange their produce beyond seas for those articles for which a demand will begin to be felt. It is unquestionable that the Americans of the North will one day supply the wants of the Americans of the South. Nature has placed them in contiguity, and has furnished the former with every means of knowing and appreciating those demands, of establishing a permanent connection with those states, and of gradually filling their markets. The merchants of the United States could only forfeit these natural advantages if he were very inferior to the merchant of Europe, to whom he is, on the contrary, superior in several respects. The Americans of the United States already exercise a very considerable moral influence upon all the peoples of the New World. They are the source of intelligence, and all the nations which inhabit the same continent are already accustomed to consider them as the most enlightened the most powerful, and the most wealthy members of the great American family. All eyes are therefore turned towards the Union, and the states of which that body is composed are the models which the other communities try to imitate to the best of their power. It is from the United States that they borrow their political principles and their laws. The Americans of the United States stand in precisely the same position with regard to the peoples of South America as their fathers, the English, occupied with regards to the Italians, the Spaniards, the Portuguese, and all those nations of Europe which receive their articles of daily consumption from England, because they are less advanced in civilization and in trade. 
England is at this time the natural emporium of almost all the nations which are within its reach. The American Union will perform the same part in the other hemisphere, and every community which is founded, or which prospers in the New World, is founded and prospers to the advantage of the Anglo-Americans. If the Union were to be dissolved, the commerce of the states which now compose it would undoubtedly be checked for a time. But this consequence would be less perceptible than is generally supposed. It is evident that, whatever may happen, the commercial states will remain united. They are all contiguous to each other, they have identically the same opinions, interests, and manners, and they are alone competent to form a very great maritime power. Even if the south of the Union were to become independent of the north, it would still require the services of those states. I have already observed that the south is not a commercial country, and nothing intimates that it is likely to become so. The Americans of the south of the United States will therefore be obliged for a long time to come to have recourse to strangers to export their produce, and to supply them with the commodities which are requisite to satisfy their wants. But the northern states are undoubtedly able to act as their intermediate agents cheaper than any other merchants. They will therefore retain that employment, for cheapness is the sovereign law of commerce. National claims and national prejudices cannot resist the influence of cheapness. Nothing can be more virulent than the hatred which exists between the Americans of the United States and the English. But notwithstanding these inimical feelings, the Americans derive the greater part of their manufactured commodities from England, because England supplies them at a cheaper rate than any other nation. Thus the increasing prosperity of America turns, notwithstanding the grudges of the Americans, to the advantage of British manufacturers. Reason shows and experience proves that no commercial prosperity can be durable if it cannot be united, in case of need, to naval force. This truth is as well understood in the United States as it can be anywhere else. The Americans are already able to make their flag respected. In a few years they will be able to make it feared. I am convinced that the dismemberment of the Union would not have the effect of diminishing the naval power of the Americans, but that it would powerfully contribute to increase it. At the present time the commercial states are connected with others which have not the same interests, and which frequently yield an unwilling consent to the increase of a maritime power by which they are only indirectly benefited. If, on the contrary, the commercial states of the Union formed one independent nation, commerce would become the foremost of their national interests. They would consequently be willing to make very great sacrifices to protect their shipping, and nothing would prevent them from pursuing their designs upon this point. Nations, as well as men, almost always betray the most prominent features of their future destiny in their earliest years. When I contemplate the ardor with which the Anglo-Americans prosecute commercial enterprises, the advantages which befriend them, and the success of their undertakings, I cannot refrain from believing that they will one day become the first maritime power of the globe. They are born to rule the seas, as the Romans were to conquer the world. End of section 42conclusion i have now nearly reached the close of my inquiry hitherto in speaking of the future destiny of the united states i have endeavored to divide my subject into distinct portions in order to study each of them with more attention my present object is to embrace the whole from one single point the remarks i shall make will be less detailed but they will be more sure I shall perceive each object less distinctly, but I shall describe the principal facts with more certainty. A traveler who has just left the walls of an immense city climbs the neighboring hills. As he goes farther off, he loses sight of the men whom he has so recently quitted. Their dwellings are confused in a dense mass. He can no longer distinguish the public squares, and he can scarcely trace out the great thoroughfares but his eye has less difficulty in following the boundaries of the city, and for the first time he sees the shape of the vast whole. Such is the future destiny of the British race in North America, to my eye. The details of the stupendous picture are overhung with shade, 
but I conceive a clear idea of the entire subject. The territory now occupied or possessed by the United States of America forms about one-twentieth part of the habitable earth, but extensive as these confines are, it must not be supposed that the Anglo-American race will always remain within them. Indeed, it has already far overstepped them. There was once a time at which we also might have created a great French nation in the American wilds to counterbalance the influence of the English upon the destinies of the New World. France formerly possessed a territory in North America scarcely less extensive than the whole of Europe. The three greatest rivers of that continent then flowed within their dominions. The Indian tribes which dwelt between the mouth of the St. Laurent and the delta of the Mississippi were unaccustomed to any other tongue but ours, and all the European settlements scattered over the immense region recalled the traditions of our country. Louisbourg, Montmorency, Duquesne, St. Louis, Vincennes, New Orleans, for such were the names they bore, are words dear to France and familiar to our ears. But a concourse of circumstances, which it would be tedious to enumerate, have deprived us of this magnificent inheritance. Wherever the French settlers were numerically weak and partially established, they have disappeared. Those who remain are collected on a small extent of country, and are now subject to other laws. The 400,000 French inhabitants of Lower Canada constitute at the present time the remnant of an old nation lost in the midst of a new people. A foreign population is increasing around them unceasingly and on all sides, which already penetrates among the ancient masters of the country, predominates in their cities, and corrupts their language. This population is identical with that of the United States. It is therefore with truth that I asserted that the British race is not confined within the frontiers of the Union, since it already extends to the Northeast. It cannot be denied that the British race has acquired an amazing preponderance over all the other European races in the New World, and that it is very superior to them in civilization, in industry, and in power. As long as it is only surrounded by desert or thinly peopled countries, as long as it encounters no dense populations upon its routes, through which it cannot work its way, it will assuredly continue to spread. The lines marked out by treaties will not stop it, but it will everywhere transgress these imaginary barriers. The geographic position of the British race in the New World is peculiarly favorable to its rapid increase. Above its northern frontiers, the icy region of the Pole extends and a few degrees below its southern confines lies the burning climate of the equator. The Anglo-Americans are, therefore, placed in the most temperate and habitable zone of the continent. The British subjects in Canada, who are dependent on the king, augment and spread almost as rapidly as the British settlers of the United States who live under a Republican government. During the War of Independence, which lasted eight years, the population continued to increase without intermission in the same ratio. Although powerful Indian nations allied with the English existed at that time upon the western frontiers, the emigration westward was never checked. Whilst the enemy laid waste the shores of the Atlantic, Kentucky, the western parts of Pennsylvania, and the states of Vermont and of Maine were filling with inhabitants. Nor did the unsettled state of the Constitution, which succeeded the war, prevent the increase of the population or stop its progress across the wilds. Thus, the difference of laws 
the various conditions of peace and war, of order and of anarchy, have exercised no perceptible influence upon the gradual development of the Anglo-Americans. This may be readily understood, for the fact is that no causes are sufficiently general to exercise a simultaneous influence over the whole of so extensive a territory. One portion of the country always offers a sure retreat from the calamities which afflict another part, and however great may be the evil, the remedy which is at hand is greater still. The British subjects in Canada, who are dependent on the king, augment and spread almost as rapidly as the British settlers of the United States, who live under a republican government. During the War of Independence, which lasted eight years, the population continued to increase without intermission in the same ratio. Although powerful Indian nations allied with the English existed at that time upon the western frontiers, the emigration westward was never checked. Whilst the enemy laid waste the shores of the Atlantic, Kentucky, the western parts of Pennsylvania, and the states of Vermont and of Maine were filling with inhabitants. Nor did the unsettled state of the Constitution which succeeded the war prevent the increase of the population or stop its progress across the wilds. Thus, the difference of laws, the various conditions of peace and war, of order and of anarchy, have exercised no perceptible influence upon the gradual development of the Anglo-Americans. This may be readily understood, for the fact is that no causes are sufficiently general to exercise a simultaneous influence over the whole of so extensive a territory. One portion of the country always offers a sure retreat from the calamities which afflict another part, and however great may be the evil, the remedy which is at hand is greater still. Thus, in the midst of the uncertain future, one event at least is sure. At a period which may be said to be near, for we are speaking of the life of a nation, the Anglo-Americans will alone cover the immense space contained between the polar regions and the tropics, extending from the coast of the Atlantic to the shores of the Pacific Ocean. The territory which will probably be occupied by the Anglo-Americans at some future time may be computed to equal three-quarters of Europe in extent. The climate of the Union is upon the whole preferable to that of Europe, and its natural advantages are not less great. It is therefore evident that its population will at some future time be proportionate to our own. Europe, divided as it is between so many different nations, and torn as it is has been by incessant wars and the barbarous manners of the Middle Ages, has notwithstanding attained a population of 410 inhabitants to the square league. What cause can prevent the United States from having as numerous a population in time? Many ages must elapse before the diverse offsets of the British race in America cease to present the same homogeneous characteristics, and the time cannot be foreseen at which a permanent inequality of conditions will be established in the new world. Whatever differences may arise from peace or from war, from freedom or oppression, from prosperity or want, between the destinies of the different descendants of the great Anglo-American family, they will at least preserve an analogous social condition, and they will hold in common the customs and the opinions to which that social condition has given birth. In the Middle Ages, the tie of religion 
was sufficiently powerful to imbue all the different populations of Europe with the same civilization. The British of the New World have a thousand other reciprocal ties, and they live at a time when the tendency to equality is general amongst mankind. The Middle Ages were a period when everything was broken up, when each people, each province, each city, and each family had a strong tendency to maintain its distinct individuality. At the present time, an opposite tendency seems to prevail, and the nation seems to be advancing to unity. Our means of intellectual intercourse unite the most remote parts of the earth, and it is impossible for men to remain strangers to each other, or to be ignorant of the events which are taking place in any corner of the globe. The consequence is that there is less difference at the present day between the Europeans and their descendants in the New World than there was between certain towns in the thirteenth century which were only separated by a river. If this tendency to assimilation brings foreign nations closer to each other, it must a fortiori prevent the descendants of the same people from becoming aliens to each other. The time will therefore come when one hundred and fifty millions of men will be living in North America. Equal in condition, the progeny of one race, owing their origin to the same cause, and preserving the same civilization, the same language, the same religion, the same habits, the same manners, and imbued with the same opinions, propagated under the same forms. The rest is uncertain, but this is certain, and it is a fact new to the world, a fact fraught with such pretentious consequences as to baffle the efforts even of the imagination. There are, at the present time, two great nations in the world which seem to tend towards the same end. Although they started from different points, I allude to the Russians and the Americans. Both of them have grown up unnoticed, and whilst the attention of mankind was directed elsewhere, they have suddenly assumed a most prominent place amongst the nations. And the world learned their existence and their greatness at almost the same time. All other nations seem to have nearly reached their natural limits, and only to be charged with the maintenance of their power. But these are still in the act of growth. All the others are stopped, or continue to advance with extreme difficulty. These are proceeding with ease, and with celerity, along a path to which the human eye can assign no term. The American struggles against the natural obstacles which oppose him. The adversaries of the Russian are men. The former combats the wilderness and savage life. The latter, civilization with all its weapons and its arts. The conquests of the one are therefore gained by the plowshare, those of the other by the sword. The Anglo-American relies upon personal interest to accomplish his ends, and gives free scope to the unguided exertions and common sense of the citizens. The Russian centers all the authority of society in a single arm, the principal instrument of the former is freedom, of the latter servitude. Their starting point is different, and their courses are not the same. Yet each of them seems to be marked out by the will of heaven to sway the destinies of half the globe. End of Conclusion End of Democracy in America, Volume 1 by Alexis de Tocqueville, translated by Henry Reeve.